Hey everyone, I'm Marissa Evangelista. I'm an MFA intern, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's We'll Talk with Artists. Our digital discussion tonight is with artists Rakai Waring and Alex Eisendolf. Alex is a mostly self-taught artist. While studying philosophy at Bazaar, he learned composition and painting from the books in their art history department. Alex states, what drives me is art with meaning, using my mind to recreate something from life or something from nothing. It is a challenge that makes art worth doing. Rakaya compares her process to cooking and gardening, where colors, flavors, and textures combine intuitively, and that passion and the passage of time are an integral part of her work. For her, that passion has existed since she was young. Even as a child, Rakaya has been using her sketchbook to record her life from direct observation. Additionally, I would like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs in the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to bridge the gap between artists and the public. Uh, thank you, Marissa. I uh, thank you for uh, Alex and Rakaya for joining us tonight. Uh, they are both jury artists that are participating in this year's Paint Annapolis. And of course, we've recently been featuring the uh, juried artists Hopefully, we will encourage even more of our viewers uh, to come out and observe them working and see what they produce next month while they're here. The three of us were having a nice conversation uh, as we were waiting to go live, and we were talking a little bit about the fact that uh, they, uh, Rakaya and uh, Alex, have been working as artists for a, a different length of time. And they're both very aware, as I feel I am as a photographer, of how the art world wants you to be some, someone as an artist that's recognizable uh, and consistent. And they're at different places in their thoughts about that. So we have Rakaya's works uh, ready to look at first. Let's put one of those up. And Rakaya, I'll ask you to, to talk about that uh, issue and Alex to join in anytime you, you feel that you have something you want to add to it. Sure. So this first piece um, is Notre Dame in Paris. Obviously, so many of you um, would recognize that. And I have a French connection um, by my mom. Um, and I spent a lot of time there. I spent a lot of time in Paris and also in the South. And immediately after college, um, my parents said to me, uh, hey, do you want to try painting in Provence? I had never been. And oh. of course. Oh yes. <laughs> yes, please. An artist's dream. An artist's dream. <laughs> yeah. So um, I did that and spent the summer painting there. And um, and in between, you know, there was Paris and Provence. And that it was so successful. And I loved it so much that I ended up spending most every spring, summer, and fall for the next 20 odd years. And uh, this piece was actually done um, not that long ago, 2018, um, during the winter um, before the tower fell, obviously. But <clears throat> I think that it's small, and I wanted to make sure that I stayed uh, with broad brushes, something actually that Alex is, you know, getting to know my work early on. I think that I used smaller brushes. I was very much influenced by... Um, if you think of Monet's haystacks and that sort of thing, he uh -huh. uses a lot of tiny little brushes. And I moved away from that because um, very much thanks to Alex telling me, you know, I think your work would be more powerful if you just uh, got bigger brushes. And I never really uh, left that. I feel really good about that decision and the way my work has progressed in that way. So I think this is a good example of the broader brushes. I, I exactly. And when I looked at uh, the work that you uh, gave us for the PowerPoint tonight, and when I looked at your website, um, I thought often that your work, while most people would look at this broken brush work and uh, say uh, impressionism, and you referenced Monet, of course, uh, to me, it's even more expressionistic because I feel the kind of uh, energy or power that I think uh, Alex must have been encouraging you to at least try out by using broader brushes. I felt like you're doing something here that's deliberate, not like an impressionist eye 
but this is the way you're responding emotionally to the scene. Is that true? Yes, very much so. I will, there's obviously there was yellow in that sky, at least I saw it. Um, yeah. And it, was, it wasn't perhaps quite like this, but this is what I've always done is I'll take what I like and I, and I will maybe exaggerate it and I will not put in the things that don't speak to me. So, it, and it's part of the simplification. Um, it's part of just taking what speaks to you and being sure that you don't put in anything extraneous. Um, that extra brush stroke that doesn't help the painting, do not put it in. And that's yeah. so hard, that balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think also uh, this relates to the smaller brush strokes. Um, you take these, these large areas of color, it creates, I think, more impact and more interest, uh, paradoxically perhaps, because in a way there's less detail. But those larger areas and the larger brush strokes, I think, create a power that the smaller brush strokes and small lines tend to drain out of a painting. So to me, when I've seen Rakai's work over the years, and I, and I see these paintings with these very broad brush strokes, uh, and then maybe in one small area, there's some small lines. And it draws my eye right to that. <laughs> and it seemed to kind of perhaps take away from a little bit of the power of that painting. And this is a small painting, which also kind of highlights uh, the relatively large brush strokes. Uh, and uh, in my mind, it makes them that much more powerful in many ways. I think those smaller paintings can have more impact than the larger ones because of that. Alex, I, I think that was very well said, uh, because this painting uh, does not, um, by its appearance, seem to be small. It, it has an impact far beyond, I mean, 9 by 12, that's a tiny painting, really. And what you're, the point you were making about small brush strokes and what that does to the viewer, if you think of something like um, uh, Mondrian, when he was uh, evolving, you know, he was working with all those tiny little brush strokes and it took him all of those years to work out that what he really wanted were big blocks of color and they were so much more uh, expressive and so much more distinctive than little tiny brush strokes. Yeah, I, that's an excellent point uh, that artists who are listening might tune their ear to. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Rakhaya, you want to look at the next one and and tell us. Um, I mean, this is just so vibrant, so so much energy. Um, yeah, thanks. So this is another period of my life um, in Gloucester, Massachusetts. I had basically been doing um, uh, landscapes for twenty years, um, and for me the boats and the ocean was somewhat novel. I mean, I'd grown up around it, but I hadn't, you know, spent time really painting it until I moved to Gloucester. And it was the thing I wanted to do. I mean, it was, it's so beautiful there. It's just the only thing I wanted to paint there. And I didn't paint landscapes for 12 years as a result. Um, so this, uh, again, I wanted to just limit my palette, create a mood, um, not put in any detail and just give the impression of what it feels like at dusk across the street in this beautiful cove. Um, this was the view from your house? Not quite. If you just walk down the street, we, we saw this Smith Cove. Uh, I envy you. Uh, <laughs> North Carolina is beautiful, but how did you carry yourself away from this? <laughs> and that's just a, that's a rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I would say that uh, I, the way you described it, you, you know, you were just sort of seeking the, uh, the intensity of the experience, I think. And I like the way you've handled uh, the many vessels that are in the cove there. This is a distinct and unique vision of boats at sunset in a safe harbor, I think. Um, uh, let's see what's up next. Next is actually different brushwork. And obviously it's because the medium yeah. is, is now, it's pencil and watercolor. 
I can't call it a strict watercolor um, because there's always that line yeah. that I like to have in the background. And sometimes I'll put a little bit of oil pastel on there as well. And I like the way it uh, resists the water or yeah, vice versa, but yeah, resists the water and creates a nice little texture. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, I look at my sketches that, that resemble this, my watercolors, and I'm always trying to make my oils look more like my watercolors. I'm not sure why. I feel that my watercolors are in a way more expressive of me and yeah. maybe because there's line in there and I'm able to put some of the details that actually matter to me. Whereas in my oils, I never really try to put detail at all. It's much more about the scene and um, the emotions of the scene. I mean, I have dozens and dozens and dozens of sketchbooks from over the years. And um, I, I start with the black line and uh, it, it's just, it's almost like a journal. It's just a record of all those places that have meant so much to me. And I've sold a lot of them and I kind of regret it because it really is very personal, those sketches. Um, this is one of them and, uh, but, and I use this to do the oil painting from, and mm -hmm. it works well as a study for an oil painting as well. Well, it, it it stands alone, I think, as a, as an independent work. And uh, back to that point of um, it, you feel that it reveals something more of yourself. Um, I think there's a real delicacy, and I mean that in the sense not of weakness, but of sensitivity uh, in your line, and even in the washes, yeah, uh, in the background, the shadowy area, visually, I could be convinced easily that two different people had painted the uh, oil the oil we just looked at and this watercolor. Let's look at the next work because it might be, no, it's, uh, hmm. it's, it's not the one that I had floating around in the back of my mind. Uh, <laughs> well, this one was directly painted from that sketch. So I, I had enough information in there uh, to work with. And then I was able to just back off on detail and just loosen up and just again, try to limit my palette um, so that it creates a mood. Um, and uh, yeah, so what can I say? Broad brushes again? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's beautiful and it's very uh, strong. Uh, and I, I would love to see more of the pairs, the one that you, uh, you admit and know that you deliberately uh, used a sketch in some way and connected it to one of your oils. So that, they're so different, but they're both equally uh, beautiful as works of art. Thank you. This just so happens to have been one of our anniversary dinners out. <laughs> that sketch and then this painting. Yeah, I know. Uh, um, now I understand. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have one more of yours, maybe two. Yep, a couple more. This one is right here in North Carolina. Um, the view out here from our home and it's wow. constantly changing. I mean, it's really, I guess, an impressionist artist's dream because you can be here every hour, you could do a different painting of exactly the same thing and have it be completely different. So um, that was one of my first paintings I did of um, right from our deck, from our wow. view. Now I understand what, what broke you away <laughs> 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 from Gloucester. Um, is this within or looking into the boundaries of me Smoky Mountain National Park? I did of um, right from our deck, from our wow. view. Now I understand what what broke you away <laughs> 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 from Gloucester. Um, is this within or looking into the boundaries of the Rocky, excuse me, Smoky Mountain National Park? The this is looking yeah, I think so because we're looking west. due west, and that's where the yeah, yeah. the park is. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always a little turned about here, but um, yeah, we're looking west, and you know, it's funny because coming here, all of a sudden, I feel like I'm back in Provence. I am back to painting the mountains, although they're a lot closer than they were from where I lived. But it's in the clouds, and the change of the the shadows that you know go down over the mountains and change yeah, the color yeah. of the foliage and life. But you've sort of introduced it yourself. 
an art historian whose special interest was the late 19th and the early 20th century cannot look at a large purple mountain broadly painted without thinking of one place in the world. And you know what that place is, <laughs> <laughs> right? I think probably all of our viewers do. Uh, in de Croix uh, and Cezanne and his little studio and painting it again and again and again. Um, I mean, you must have known that when you first painted. You must have had that in the back of your mind somehow. Well, to be honest, I did not. I, 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 I did not. I, I know that. So after the fact, um, somebody said something about, oh, Cezanne. And I'm yeah. like, of course, you know, he painted the Aix-en-Provence yeah. mountain time and again, like you said. Yeah. And But um, I didn't have it. I just had what I had in my vision that just so inspired me. And that's what came out. Um, uh, but I suppose that when I paint, you know, sunflower fields or um, poppy fields or something, people will say, oh, that's that's so, you know, Monet, that's so Van Gogh. And it has to do with a subject more than than anything else. We have another one. I guess the last one. Yeah. And again, local um, goat farms all around here. And <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite animals. I, I grew up. Um, milking goats, raising goats. And uh, so I am drawn to goats and there are some um, that come graze close by. Um, so I just, this is a little one and I, yeah, probably do a lot more. <laughs> okay, this is extremely broadly brushed. Yeah. And I see the date is 2023. Yeah, I mean, it's so small that the last thing I want to do is is in small my brushes because the canvas is small. This is why smaller paintings are actually a lot harder for me to do and sometimes take just as long as bigger ones because you have to just, you have to keep the broad brush but put in just the necessary stuff. And um, it's really hard to keep it simple on such a small canvas. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a short article is much harder to write than a long article in, in writing. Yeah. Alex, how do you feel about this idea of scale uh, making it even more difficult to accomplish your ends in such a small area? Well, I, I think Rakaia said it uh, right. Uh, you have to be very intentional about uh, what marks you put on your canvas or paper because uh, everything has to work harder. You, mm -hmm. you have to fit it in a small place. You don't want to get out the single hair brush. Uh, you want to do something that's loose. And I think it's, it's not just a good way to force yourself to be loose, to do small paintings, but it also in many cases produces more vibrant, more, uh, I don't know, active work, I suppose. And, uh, so that means paradoxically, you have to concentrate more. I suppose it's less forgiving than yeah. a large piece. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I like to sleep on a piece though. I like to, a plein air piece, I like to look at it the next morning because it always looks different to me. And yeah. it might be like a couple brush strokes or something like that, but. You're creating a, an original work of art very rapidly and directly before your subject. And if you did it in the studio or even heavily reworked it in the studio, it's a different work of art. Yes. So this is more dynamic, more vital, more original, more, more you. I, I knew this was coming and I just love the way that you two set it up. Uh, and and um, <laughs> Pennsylvanian goat, I'm a big Dracula. <laughs> and Bram Stoker, you know, the original <laughs> Dracula. I'm going to go see Renfield, the movie with Nicolas Cage, even though he's gone way off the tracks, I think. But anyway, yeah. why well, Transylvania? I and... Yeah, I wish I could. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, why Transylvania? Why Transylvania? Uh, so it's it, I, the explanation is much more prosaic. Uh, it's the goat was in the county of Transylvania, North Carolina. I uh, gotcha. So, uh, and uh, I'll talk about it now. I was going to mention it later, but uh, 
I actually deliberately try not to use evocative titles. Uh, I want the title to sit in the background. Not that, you know, I'm going to start numbering my paintings uh, as many, you know, abstract artists do who don't want to imbue meaning. Uh, I don't want to imbue meaning for a different reason. I want the meaning to come out of the painting. And I hope that shows up more in some of the following pieces. But in this case, um, you know, after, since moving to North Carolina, it's very rural where we are. There's lots, yeah. we can see goats from our own window. <laughs> uh, and um, I just found that there's uh, a great sort of understated nobility in these farm animals. And uh, I just really love drawing and painting mm -hmm. them because uh, just, you know, capturing a goat uh, or a, a, a cow or a horse or whatever, uh, standing in a pasture or, or walking around, um, there's just something really, I don't know, captivating about that, that I try to capture. And when I do something like this, um, you know, I might do a sketch quickly first. I usually do because animals have a bad habit of moving around. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I may work from that sketch, even if I'm still outside uh, plein air doing it. Uh, and then I'm trying to capture that vitality that you can get in a small sketch in a thumbnail that often gets lost in translation to a larger piece. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this one's quite small, so it's easier to, to do that with a, with a, a piece of pastel because you have no choice in this case. Um, I try to capture that movement in as few strokes as possible to maintain that, that energy in, in the picture. But I saw the energy and dynamism in light itself, not in the animal. Am I being somehow misguided and misjudging yeah. what you're doing? No, I, I want that dynamism in the picture. I want my image, even if it's an animal standing stock still, or if it's a, a, a back alley scene, I want that in my painting. And if I can't capture that, I kind of consider it a failure. And sometimes I, when I overwork something, I drain that, that vitality out of the painting. So I don't care if the, if the goat is just standing there like a stump, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the trick to me is I've only got, you know, maybe if I'm lucky 15 or 20 seconds to get a quick gesture of uh -huh. that. Uh, and then uh, I want my pastel strokes to define those planes in as few strokes as possible. And that way, I can maintain that. Uh, the way the painting looks is vital, not necessarily that he's standing still. You said everything that I was thinking about this image, which makes me feel good because you <laughs> you did such a wonderful job. Uh, of saying it, but more importantly, of creating it. Uh, so if that was your intention going into it, I think you hit the ball out of the park here. Here's the two questions, though, that I think kind of get at who you are as artists, singly and together, and as people, one of the questions. And that is, how do you manage to live together, work together, paint the same subjects and not avoid friction? We found that it's very easy for us to avoid friction, at least in that narrow area. There's plenty of friction in the rest of our lives. But, <laughs> um, and I think, I think the reason is that we know each other's boundaries. And there are some great advantages, by the way, of having somebody who is uh, a, an accomplished, knowledgeable artist yeah uh to say critique a piece that i just finished because i can't see it uh -huh. so you know uh, that's one of the great disadvantages of being the creator of your own work is that it's very very difficult uh -huh. to see it objectively just after you finished it yeah. so she can walk in and ask you know hey how come there's uh why does that guy have three eyeballs you know it doesn't make sense to me you know and you know things that should be obvious 
but aren't. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate that. Occasionally I do that uh, for her as well, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, uh, that, that's a great resource. And as long as you know, we can read the room and uh, I can tell and she can tell when we're not looking for feedback. Uh, yeah. that's really, that's really the, the no-go area. And then we work very well together. I mean, we, you know, we've got pieces hanging together up here because we have, uh, for the purposes of this video, but we have two separate, uh, studio spaces. And so we don't really cross paths much, uh, when we're working. And I think that's uh, that's one way to sort of keep the peace. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It makes perfect sense. I'm glad you've worked that out. Um, and this is a perfect example. I love scenes like this myself. Uh, uh, but I want to ask you this question that relates to uh, the previous uh, work as well. You describe pastel as painting, and you're entered in painted Annapolis. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know the kind of the, the history of that but I'm also an academic putting on that hat. And I don't think pastel is painting. Yeah, I actually don't either, um, <laughs> but I'm kind of <laughs> bent, you know, to the, the sort of general, I was told by someone that, you know, for God's sake, whatever you say, don't, don't tell a pastel artist that that's a drawing. Uh, and, you know, to me, it's, it's not an important distinction. I, uh, I'm happy to call it whatever it is. I'm partly drawn to it, no pun intended, because of the drawing aspect of it. Uh -huh. so, uh, I see them as maybe kind of, you know, occupying both camps in a way, right? Uh, and you can get big flat areas just like you can with paints. And I have no problem thinking that as a painting and a shorthand, that's what I do. I don't mm -hmm. want to anger anybody out there <laughs> who doesn't see it that way um, uh, or does. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I like to draw. Uh, that's kind of my strength. Uh, that's why, frankly, I gravitated to not just pastel, but also to this kind of tonalist sort of approach. Uh, I wanted to, in a sense, clear my palette literally and figuratively in terms of uh, working with the fundamentals of values and shapes and composition. And by doing so, you're really forced to get those things right or as right as possible, or at least think as you know deliberately as possible mm -hmm. about those things. And um, in a sense, I think, uh, you know, as some of the tonalists, of, which you're probably, frankly, much more familiar with uh, academically and otherwise than I am, because I came to this from a different direction. Um, I think in a sense, there's there's kind of a stillness that you get with uh, with tones when you you desaturate the paintings. And it's kind of a mental palette cleanser in a sense. So it's not just me being forced to see these images in values and in shapes and areas and lines and composition. It also forces the viewer to look at it that way as well. So yes. I think many times people really respond to it. I get two responses, by the way. Uh, some people like really, really, you know, are into it and they get very excited about it. And then a much larger group just are completely left, you know, flat <laughs> and couldn't possibly <laughs> care less. It. And, uh, yeah. you know, so those those are it's one or the other. I, I don't get uh, uh, in between stuff. <laughs> right, let's move on, because I want to look at your work. And so does everybody else. This image and the other one, there's an atmospheric effect. There's or, or maybe it. To me, it's almost a tangible atmosphere. That I can see and almost feel. Is that deliberate? Uh, I would say it's maybe um, more incidental from a couple of things. Number one, uh, it's the technique. Uh, I don't ever want to work in in flat hues, you know, where I'm just taking 
one pastel. And even if it just happens to be exactly the color that, that is in life and just rub that all over the place, it makes for a very dull, you know, painting. So uh, I like to introduce some layers. I like to introduce other tones or even some other colors in there. And I think that inevitably the result of that is you get a little bit of atmospheric kind of effect. Mm -hmm. I am in a sense trying to create stories or at least mm -hmm. be evocative. I want somebody to look at this alleyway and maybe think about who lives in that apartment, uh, who's what's going on behind those windows. Uh, and I don't want to hit people overhead the head with a sledgehammer, but I do want people to get a sense that there's more there than just what meets the eye. And I think that atmosphere uh, yeah. is maybe inherent in that idea. Right. So that's that's kind of what I'm doing there. I, I, I think that if I can create a stillness, I mean, I know how to draw the figure. I've been doing that for many years, but I seldom put them in my paintings. And the reason is that I find that that just overwhelms the story that I'm telling here. Now, I may go back and occasionally do that kind of thing, but um, to me, I want I want the viewer to be involved. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but I want the viewer to be involved in that. I want them to look at this and uh, and see beyond the bricks and the windows. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think you accomplished that in the images of yours that I've seen, including the ones on your website. Uh, and I don't myself find a work of art very compelling if I can just take it in a glance and I and I really feel like I've understood it. Well, I, don't, I don't know if that's why would I hang that on my wall? Why would I continue to look at it? But you have that kind of depth for sure. Was there one more image before those uh, figure drawings? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here there's. The reason I wanted to look at this is I think the the way that you've used a monochromatic palette to create such brightness is uh, must be quite difficult. How did you do that? Well, uh, a lot of it because of the the kind of monochromatic approach that I take, I have to be very deliberate about my subject matter. So uh, I'm looking for uh compositions that either have or can be made to have the kinds of darks and lights and and intermediary tones that will create the the final uh, effect that I'm looking for. So that's the first job. Uh, I'm always looking at everything uh, through that lens and, then, uh, uh, in a way, I've already constructed that composition in my head before mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. to even put uh, a line down on the on the uh, board, and uh, um, that uh, you know that to me is just if you look at it in an abstract way, and I think learning abstract art is very important because uh, it forces you to look purely at the shapes of a composition. And I'm always thinking about that as well. So I will uh, think about what large shapes there are in a composition and how I'm going to treat them. And usually I'm trying to make them flat. I like the, the look, frankly, of a flat area. It evokes kind of, uh, uh, in many ways, those sort of abstract, you mentioned Mondrian almost, Wandering like kind of uh, separation of, mm -hmm. of large and small forms and lines in different directions, and uh, so all of those things are that and more. Frankly, are part of that process of creating a composition. And I, I do want to talk a little bit about the subject matter while we're on these kinds of things. I mean, some people call them. Uh, this kind of subject, uh, you know, maybe somewhat derisively as uh, ruin porn. Uh, I think that's a very sort of misleading kind of way to look at these things. Um, I mean, first of all, it's not accurate because I, I don't generally do 
burned out buildings and that sort of thing and broken window places, all of the places I tend to do are occupied and in use. And that to me also brings some vitality and story to them. Not that the others don't have that old, you know, slightly ragged threadbare buildings out there are just frankly more interesting. You know, it's, it's better than, I don't know, uh, ranch house porn or something like that. <laughs> I, I something that's, that's interesting. And so that's where I get to these subjects. And, you know, everything else is kind of serving that purpose of that mood that I'm trying to create. And the composition is a key thing to that. Well, I, I've heard that term also. And um, as I understand it, I wouldn't say this is ruined porn um, because I think you've accomplished what you said you intend to accomplish uh, and various other reasons, but that's a, a different sort of conversation to have. Uh, but thanks for sharing your time with all of us this evening. And I, I look forward to meeting you at Paint Annapolis. Okay. We do too. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really fun. Great. Was Great. Thanks. thanks again, Marissa. And thanks for everybody who uh, uh, joined us this evening. All right. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Right. Okay. Yeah, you, you too. All.